Milo, this is Milo's roadmap to success. Um, sit, I would pet Milo, but Milo has an issue where he is, bites people sometimes when they pet him. So um, this is kind of an unusual session. I didn't, uh, uh, Milo's guardian is one of my best friends from high school. So uh, it's been quite a while. Um, and uh, so I'm at a reunion and we're working on some stuff. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a treat and train right back here, and the Guardian is going to do a lot of work with that. I'm not going to talk about that because you have a video for that. Um, the first thing I really kind of talk to him about is, is really the, whole, the structure we have at the home life. Um, basically, what has happened is, I don't know if it's a resource Guardian. I haven't seen any indication of any of the reactivity, but again, I'm not trying to pet him specifically for this reason. Sit. So a good rule of thumb is if you ever reach to pet a dog, you want to reach like this. See how he didn't engage with me? That's his way of saying, I'm not, I'm cool with you not petting me. Mm -hmm. If they turn their head to the side or back up or lower it, they're saying, I don't want you to pet me. What do we do? We pet him anyways. Mm -hmm. well, after a while, the dog like maybe kind of lowers his head or bears its teeth or its ears go back or its mouth goes back and people still keep on petting me. Well, eventually one day I have a crappy day and somebody pets me and I nip at him and they back away. And they're like, oh, so this is a cool way that I can ask people to move away is by acting aggressive. He's not, he doesn't manifest aggression in other situations. Now, his guardians really didn't have any rules for him. Uh, he probably needs a little bit more exercise and he's able to paw or demand attention. And kind of like I have a relative that is uh, not always the nicest with everybody else. And so everybody in the family, like when that person is having a day where they're actually amicable, like, oh my God, you're here. And they're like, what can I do with you? They're just, so I think the guardians kind of have a similar principle with him. They were worried about him biting. And so like anytime he wants to demand attention, they're like, oh, you, I, now it's okay for me to pet you. Well, and that's, I think, created a little bit of a, 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 a dynamic that's not necessarily super healthy. I think he also thinks, and you can see him breathing heavy. Um, I think, now, it could be overweight, but I think this is a manifestation of stress. And it could be stress is magnified by being a little bit overweight. Um, but I noticed throughout this, uh, I've been here for overnight, and so he would, like, sit, and he always orientates. So he's looking at the door, or he's positioned next to the door, which is kind of a guard dog. I don't think he's so much a guard dog, but more of a guard sentry dog. So I'm going to alert when people come here. And if there's a knock on the door, he barks like crazy. This is going to help with that. And I've got other videos that can help you with it. Um, but I'll talk about just kind of what I want you guys to go through. So the first thing we want to do is we want to start uh, by increasing this exercise. Uh, we talked about uh, not thinking of the, the walk as completing a circuit. We complete a loop and then we're putting an arbitrary, we have to finish this loop. So we worry about the time. The dog stops to sniff. We're like, come on, come on. He actually doesn't sniff, which is a problem. Um, but normally what you want to do, what I tell people to do is go for a walk 15 minutes this way. If I'm going for a 30 minute walk, I walk this way for 15 minutes and the dog gets a sniff and do whatever he wants within reason. And, uh, and we'll talk about a way to get him a sniff here in a sec. And then when I hit 15 minutes, halfway, I cross the street and I turn around and come back. So you're not walking the same ground and he should be sniffing. Now, uh, because he doesn't sniff, he doesn't sniff people. He doesn't, he's not using his nose. Now he has uh, a medical issue where he has kind of a stuffed up nose and that probably is a contributing factor here. But we still do things to help him get back to using his nose. So what I'd like you to do is get some sh finely shredded cheese. Uh, cheddar works fine. Um, and what you want to do is go on your route but have somebody go ahead of you. And then I would start this off by in the backyard. Get some of that shredded cheese, show them that you have it, and then sprinkle it in the grass. We want it in the grass because we want him to have to work for it. We want to kind of simulate sniffing the ground. He'll be sniffing and licking. That's okay. So we do it in the backyard and you get to see him do it, see him do it again. And so, you know, a small handful, so there's not just like five pieces, there's a, a good amount, but it's not lying on top, it's kind of sprinkled along. So you might kind of do a little bit of like that. So the idea, do that in the backyard, and when he's looking up, you might want to assign a command word for that, call it buffet, or something that means like a lot of it. And then basically do it at like five or six different pieces in the yard. And after a while, it should be like you go like this, and he's just immediately on it. Then what you do is um, go on a walk shortly thereafter, and on the walk before the walk, we're going to set him up. So somebody's going to go on the walk ahead of us, and we're going to like uh, go in a certain place. Maybe you just do, to make it easy, maybe the first, the second driveway on each block, right after the second driveway, I'm going to go in and sprinkle the cheese right, between, right next to the sidewalk. So you know where it's at. So you have somebody that goes and preps the course for you. And then you go out and you kind of, when you get there, you kind of just stop next to it. And hopefully we like him to identify himself. After he does it a couple of times, he should pretty easily. If he doesn't, then kind of tap your uh, foot down, tap the ground a little bit. And he's like, oh, and that's why I like the yellow or white cheese because it shows up really nice on green grass. And then he'll start looking and again, say buffet every time he's getting this uh, in the grass. Um, now you could say buffet thinking it's like a long version of it, but you might maybe come up with something, a word like more like explore 
or greeting, because that's really how they do explore things with their nose. So what we're doing is we're creating a scenario where he's practicing doing that. Um, so when the person goes and does it the first time, just go second driveway or third driveway, however you want to do it. And then just a little, you know, maybe about, you know, 12 inches worth of the cheese. And then go the next block, second driveway, 12 inches of cheese. After a while, then you want to do it maybe uh, another driveway, uh, another, you know, so he doesn't never know where it is. The idea, what we're looking to achieve is him sniffing the ground, looking for cheese on the walk. And that gets out, and now he's getting back to being a dog, sniffing and meeting things with his nose. Yeah, talking about you, buddy. And so, um, and so you probably are going to have to do this for each walk. So have somebody go on the walk ahead of you and sprinkle it. Maybe the first time it's, don't always do it the first drive, after the first drive. Sometimes the first, sometimes the third. Maybe it's every other no, odd-numbered house or whatever that you want to do. We want to do a lot at first and then gradually less and less. And so he just starts exploring just to explore. That's the goal. Uh, but keep on going back to the cheese until you get, but when you see him stopping and sniffing, stop and let him sniff. That's what we want him to do. Uh, so come up, maybe explore would be a better word for the cheese. Um, that way you can, you, you say explore at a park and you say buffet, people look at you like you're a little bit weird. Um, okay. So exercise is really important. He's also had two hips replaced. And so he might have some issues with mobility. Um, I, uh, you, I, you have him on the chondroitin. Uh, you might want to look and make sure that he's got a good glu glucosamine component to it. Um, uh, if it's okay for him to do, one of the things that I do is a dog Stairmaster. Uh, so I show him that I have a treat, and I, when he's looking at me, I throw it to the bottom of the stairs. And when he goes to the bottom of the stairs and licks it up, I come up with a funny word. I like say Australia. That means to go down the stairs or go south. Then I show, show him the bag of treats or call him back up when he comes up, give him another treat. And this time I might say aspen or a word that means go up the stairs. So we do this with an empty stomach the first time. We throw the treats up and down the stairs until he looks at you like you're crazy. But another 44 times, I'm not going down there anymore. Now we know what his maximum number is. Now you shouldn't exercise a dog with food in their stomach because it can tear. Um, so about an hour after exercise, uh, after eating. But for him, I think he's gonna be doing most of his eating through snuffle mat, which is also make sure you order that. And I would try to feed him at least one meal a day with snuffle mat. Up there we have a omega treat ball, but there are other treat dispensing toys. And you don't have to show that, this is just for you guys. Um, but there's other treat dispensing toys. Now a Kong is different. The one that you have, the Wobble Kong is different because uh, the Kong, if you just put it in there, it just all falls out right away. The Wobble Kong you have, he has to work a little bit each time. Uh, but coming up with uh, different shapes and sizes, somebody will put like paper cups down on the ground and put treats under one. He's got to like go paw at it. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can do that. So the, uh, the doggy uh, Stairmaster that I call it um, is something you can do very quickly. Five minutes of throwing treats up in the stairs is equivalent to like a half an hour walk. So uh, one of the things I would suggest is we have three uh, young, uh, young ladies in the house and they have a lot of friends that come over and the guardians are always uh, concerned because he has bitten people who try to pet him. So they tell everybody, make sure you don't pet. Well, we can set him up for success for that to making sure he's exercised before they arrive. So I would set a house rule that no friends are allowed to come unless they text us at least five minutes ahead of time. If they forget, then they have to text us and wait outside for five minutes, actually for 15 minutes, um, 15 minutes ahead of time. Cause it takes five minutes to throw the treats up and down the stairs, but we need to give him 10 minutes to recollect himself before he sees anyone or hears anything. Once he sees, he's all boisterous. And it just like us, if we're out of breath and then we're in a stressful situation. That's going to make us not perform at our optimal level. So uh, the rule is, you know, somebody's coming over, they text you and you immediately go to the stairs and you spend five minutes throwing the treats up and down the stairs unless he has food in his belly, which I don't think would be the case. Then he gets 10 minutes to recover. Then when the people come in, it's easier. We set him up for success. He doesn't have all that excess energy. It's going to make it easier for him to be more accommodating. Um, now, I'd also, uh, what I would do is I would... Uh, I, uh, I don't know where it went. I have a treat pouch. The treat pouch that I have is a mini treat pouch from PetSafe. Um, the, the small is like this big. So get the mini one, like the one that I have. I would get a several of them. And I would say every time friends or people come in, you load it up with some of his, his kibble and they give it to him and just say, look, anytime he does something you want, instead of petting him, give him a piece of kibble, but he has to do something to earn it first. Don't just give him the kibble. You could in if he's not sure if he likes someone, but I would really prefer, you want the kibble, you gotta sit. And then they uh, hold the uh, kibble out in their hand. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't, I mean, I can give it one like this, and he's not chopping on my fingers. He doesn't have a hard mouth, but if they feel uncomfortable, they can just do it like this. Now, front facing is confrontational, sideways approachable, leaning over a dog can be intimidating. So if they're giving him a treat, what we'd like them to do is hold the treat out to their side and preferably crouch down and let him come and lick it off, and then he's gonna walk away or he's gonna move his head away. Now, I didn't have a treat in my hand, but I've had a whole bunch. 
But usually, well, I'll do one with an actual treat. So sit, sit. See, I kept my hand there. See, it came, kept back a second time. It licked it a little bit. Uh, also, a quick little lesson there. I say a command word twice if the dog knows it. So he has a down command, right? Down. Down. So I told him what to do, what I refer to as the command stage, and I said down, and then when he did what I wanted, I paid him the treat as a form of payment. Then I put in context why I'm giving him the treat by saying the command word a second time. Now, and this is not unusual, but this house does what a lot of people do. Sit, sit. That makes two different words. Dogs hear inflection. So say sit, sit. Try not to have any change in how you say it. You can say cities all the time. That's fine. We just want to make it consistent. We say between 2,000 and 11,000 words as humans, and it's the more words we use, the harder it is for him to keep up with the conversation. So we just say, and they hear the first word we say the most prominently. So just say sit, not good sit, not good boy, just sit, just down, or whatever it is. Um, okay, so um, coming up with some ways where we can exercise him. Exercise is best multiple times throughout the day. So take him for an hour walk is great, but he's going to sleep for an hour, and then he wakes up and he's ready to go, and you have to do something else to exercise him. So what you want to do instead is exercise him, and then maybe two hours later, exercise him again. Um, and maybe you do one exercise as a walk, the next exercise two hours later is the treat tossed on the stairs, the next one is feeding out of his, excuse me, out of his snuffle mat, sorry buddy. Um, and the idea is uh, sniffing is very relaxing and is physically draining for dogs to use their nose. So di don't discount things that causes him to sniff. This is why I have snuffle mat and those treat dispensing toys make him work for his food, also boosts his self-esteem, which can have a nice benefit as well. Um, so uh, before we have guests come over, if there's a cross country team is gonna be running by your house before they come by, set them up for sex. You're gonna have people come over for a dinner party, get them a lot of exercise. So the idea is to set him up so that he doesn't, you know, we're, we're putting him in a good position to succeed. Now he likes to bark at people who come by. Like I said, getting back to the guard dog or the sentry dog. Um, we call this maintenance, where if somebody has a, has a problem with something, we don't want them to be tempted by it. Same thing for dogs. So every time he runs to the window, he sees somebody coming, he barks at them, and then they, they leave. Well, they were just passing by the street anyways. He doesn't see it that way. He thinks they were coming to invade your house. He barked, and after he barked, what happened? They left. Well, my barking must have been what left, made them leave. So it validates. And every time that does, that reinforces the guard dog personality and that behavior. So what I recommend is we call it Roman blinds. Roman blinds are blinds at the bottom of the window. What I usually recommend is if you go to King, uh, Kinko's or Office Max, they have this three feet wide uh, or tall, and the, the banner you can make as long as you want. So get one of those so you can kind of get weird you know, windows and measure it and cut it exact. Tape it preferably on the outside of the window. If you have storm windows like that one, I don't think you can, but a lot of times the dog will scrape it off. If he does, he'll just continue to scrape it off. So it's on the outside, at least to start off with, once the weather gets crappy, then you can put it on the inside and he kind of gets out of a hat. Because I go there and I don't get the validation of being able to bark them. I might hear them out there, but I can't see them. And if I, and if I do see them and I bark, I don't see them walk away. So you have windows here and here. I don't worry about the back, but uh, on the other side of your door, and then you might need to do one behind the piano. But you want to just set it up just so that if he's up on his tiptoes, he looks out and he can't see anything. So after a while, that way, that will help him get out of the habit. Remember, it takes 66 days to form a behavior pattern. So every time I run over here and bark at them, that validates it. Well, I run over there and I can't see them. Less time, I, next time I'm less likely to want to do that. Sit. Remember, only say it once. If you say it once and he doesn't do it within three seconds, then you uh, just find something else to do. I would pet you, but uh, we're not sure about that. So I probably could get away with petting him, but we just want to make sure this is a good video. Um, all right, so uh, whenever you're uh, not sure, always be conservative. I am not conservative, but that's the one time I am conservative. It's better to be safe than sorry. Um, so um, there are other things that get him all riled up. Ask yourself, is it healthy for him to be seeing those things? If it's not, maybe we need to arrange something so that he learns not to, so he doesn't get exposure to whatever that thing is. And then when he does that, right there, you can be setting, paying him and saying sit. Remember, you say it within three seconds of him doing it. Dogs learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them to have the ability to make the connection, but it has to be repeated over and over consistently enough before they are like, oh, and now I make the connection. One time probably is not going to be enough. So exercise is a big component. Um, the next thing I asked, uh, I talked to them about were rules. Um, and just like most of my clients, he really doesn't have any rules. So if a dog doesn't have any rules that sees you as a peer, if it sees you as a peer, then listening to is now optional. 
And that's kind of, I think, one of the things we have going on in this house. So we're not going to dominate him and punish him and force him. We're going to create scenarios where he does what we want, something good happens. And instead of us policing him off the furniture, which is one of the rules, the guardian's going to order X mats. We put the X mats down on the pad. He comes, it won't feel good to sit on the X mats. So he'll try it once or twice. It doesn't feel good and he gets off the couch. Um, and that way that's policing it for us. So we're using a tool to create a scenario. Now, if he does get on the couch, you want him to get down. If you try to force him, he might push back. I don't think he would. But again, that's force. That's not what I like to do. So what I would do is take my treat pouch, because I always have one, have a bunch of those. And then basically show him that I have a treat and throw it on the floor. When he jumps on the floor to get it, I would, and it licks up the treat. Remember, always say the command word after the treat goes in the mouth. So he licks it up, say the word off. Then grab your X mat from under the couch and put it back on that cushion. So when he comes back, he can't go back up there. It's, it's saving the space. After, it takes 66 days to form a behavior pattern. So I'd say leave him up there for at least three months. After three months, there's three on the couch that are right behind where the camera is right now. Maybe after three months, what I would do is remove one of them. Instead of one on each cushion, move two in between the two on the cracks. And so you want it gradually dissipating. And then you can eventually tear them in half and put a half on this side, half on that side. After a while, he just gets out of the habit of doing that. Now, at the same time, we showed him how to use the dog bed. I'd like to have the dog bed in every room that he hangs out in so he has a designated place to stay. Now, we should say the name of the dog bed um, every time he looks the treat up. So what I do, when I taught him this, I just dropped, when he was looking, I threw a treat here. He came over and licked it up, and I said the word beach, which is the word that we decided on for this dog bed. Each dog bed has, should have its own unique word. So you throw it, about 10 treats in a row. Throw the treat, as, as long as he's got one or more paws on it, he licks it up, we say the word beach. Wait for him to vacate it, and then throw another one. Do that for 10 treats in a row. Then when he's not paying attention, throw a treat on here, and then it's sitting right here. Don't point it out to him. Let him find it on his own. When he does, say the word beach. And the third way I do is I lead him over onto it and I put him in a sit or an L-A-Y and I pop the treat in his mouth and say the word beach when it goes into his mouth. So I'm associating three ways to entice or motivate him to go here. What will happen after a while is he'll start going here on his own because good things happen here. So every time you get a new trick, a new toy or a new chewy or whatever, he should find it on a dog bed so it creates an even more of a positive association. Once you make the transition, he goes here on his own, then you take the treat because you have your treat pouch. And as soon as he goes there, you pull one out and you throw it, boom, boom, we're in Kansas, you know, Jayhawks. Um, and so play a little basketball. So now he's like, every time I come here, it rains treats. Why wasn't I here the whole time? I'm like, couch, I don't get any treats. After a while, he motivates and then you say the word. So if he hangs out in any of the girls' bedrooms, he should have a dog bed in, in those rooms. The dog bed should be either a light cream, a white, or a light gray. There should be no pattern. And also, uh, this is, there's nothing wrong with this one. But the problem with this one is you see if it bunches up, I could have a treat here and he wouldn't be able to see it. So I prefer to get ones that are more like your cush, couch cushion so it's pretty snug. And so if I put a treat there because of the contrasting colors, I'm going to see it and there's no crevices for it to go in. I don't know what they call it, but they have like, you know, buttons in the middle of the cushion. Don't get one of those. Um, I find Groupon's the cheapest place to, get, place to get them. I would get one probably a medium for him or a medium or large. And some of them have little sides to it. Just make sure it's not on all four sides because then it files in the, crab, in the crevice. So you want it just real easy. So one, and this is the place I like to put it right under the TV because he's like, look at you guys just looking at me so much. We're really just watching Jayhawks uh, kick somebody's butt in basketball. <laughs> okay, so um, also have one in uh, the basement. There's a hangout room in the basement. So when the kids are doing their stuff, you put it up to the side, but when he's there, he doesn't have, he doesn't go on the couch. Um, Okay, so uh, that's the first rule, not being allowed on the furniture. And at the end of the 90 days, if you decide you like him on the furniture, remember that rewarding a dog by breaking a rule is very confusing. If you want to reward him, I would reward him for doing this, use the treat and train, have him do some touch and hand targeting exercises, uh, the focus exercise, different things along those lines, so that you know he's reward, earning his attention. Breaking a rule to reward a dog is very confusing because he's gonna keep on wanting to go back up there. But let's say that we get done, he's no longer biting people, you know, he's very well behaving, you know, I have no, no other problems, it's been six months, and you decide I'd like to invite him up, it's a one-time pass. I invite you up, this is a one-time privilege, as soon as you get down to get a drink of water, you would need another invitation to get back up. Or if I invite you up and you start barking, I'm going to throw a treat on the ground, and then when you go on the ground, I put the X-Max back, you lose that privilege. It's for good behavior. But remember, the higher a dog sits, the more rank or status they have. Sitting at the same height as you says we are peers. So it's okay to be peers if you invite him up, but if he has the inviting, and you don't correct him, then that's saying, yeah, you're, I'm cool with you being the same status as me. So at that point, afterwards, it's a one-time exception each time the human decides they'd like to invite him up. But he also paused and invades people's personal space. 
not allowing on the furniture for a couple months helps him practice new behaviors and not nudging and, and calling at you for attention. Remember when he has items in his mouth, I'm gonna get back to exercise, I'm just gonna throw these random things as they come into my head. Remember, if he has something in his mouth and practices bully sticks, every time he gives him a bully stick, I would grab like 10 treats. And don't let him see you have the treats when he's got the bully stick in his mouth. He's not holding it, it's exclusively in his mouth. Or any of these items he's allowed to have, go over there quietly and hold the treat in front of his nose and just wait. Don't tell him to drop, wait. And as soon as he drops it, put it in his mouth, say the word drop, and don't show any interest in the item. And try to avoid pulling things away from him as much as you can. Uh, unless it's an emergency. After a while, if you get a good drop, you can say drop and you go, where's my treat? And that's what we're looking for. So um, we wanna be as force-free as possible. Um, okay, other rules, um, I would say, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna let him through a door, he has to sit first. And I'm only gonna say it once. I would recommend you guys use a vocabulary, word, uh, say the word vocabulary. People are using a different version of the word. Come up with a list of the official command words. Most people don't realize they talk to the dogs as if they speak English. Come here. Come here, come here, over here, here boy, dog's name, dog's nickname, whistle, tap my thigh. Now he has 10 command expressions he has to listen for. It's much easier for all of us exclusive to say come. So make a list of the official command words and try to, whenever possible, come up with funny command words. I say celebrate means that you're missing an opportunity to reward the dog. Uh, you know, paycheck, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but vocabulary means you're using the wrong version of the word. Repeat means you're repeating the word or rerun or whatever you wanna say, echo. So we don't wanna repeat it over and over. We'll train him not to listen to us and not to respect us. Um, so the idea is um, uh, for the, uh, God, what was, I forgot where I was at before that, when I started the, with the words, uh, the vocabulary words. Rules. Uh, what's that? Rules. Rules. Uh, well, yeah, but I was, I was somewhere, it'll come back to me. Never say you can't remember, always say it'll come back to you. So, um, so, we come, so just coming up with the command words and making at least half of them fun words as possible. Call this Jamaica, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, okay, so, um, so to the door. So I go to the door, I tell him to sit one time. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk away and sit down somewhere in the area. Make sure you're seated. When you're standing, you look like you're waiting for him. So sit down somewhere, pull out your phone and check an email, play a game, read a little magazine, newspaper, whatever it is, watch a little TV. But ask Google or Siri for a one minute timer. After one minute, go back to the door and don't ask him, can you sit, buddy? No. So Milo, sit. And I wouldn't say Milo, I'd just say sit. And again, he has three seconds to comply. If he doesn't comply at this time, you walk away and sit down for two minutes. Next time you sit down for four minutes, then eight minutes and so on. I'm saying if you want to go outside and you want something from me, you got to pay for it. And you pay for it the, do it through a currency of obedience. And I'm asking you to do the smallest thing you can possibly do as a dog and sit. And if you can't be bothered to sit, guess what, buddy? I can't be bothered to open that door. But boy, as soon as that butt hits the ground, that door opens like there's grease lightning on it. So after a while, he will go sit at the door as his way of saying, I'd like to go outside. Now, he kind of goes over there now, but I think he's more in patrol and he's demanding, he's paws at it. Um, so you might want to think about, well, changing your handle to a round handle because uh, once they can you know he's, he can do it and lets himself in, the wrong situation, he gets out and somebody pets him. And I've had situations where like, this might be a triggered response from you. If somebody else that doesn't know any better might go over and pet him, he might be fine with it because he doesn't have the baggage with you guys. He doesn't feel like he's protecting or the guard dog for you guys, uh, for the other people. So um, again, it'll, you'll have to have a lot of failures back and forth, but eventually you say sit, and when he sits, then you open the door. Um, I would do it for this door, any bedroom doors, the door to go outside. He has a dog door, so he's not gonna do it for there. Um, you can eventually teach him to sit and wait to go through a, an open door until he gets permission. I have videos for that, so message me if you want to know how to do that. I can show you how to do it. But the first stage is teaching him how to sit at the door. Um, also, he should not, uh, when eating, uh, it's the most important activity for dogs. So whoever's feeding him should eat something first. If you're feeding him out of a bowl, I would recommend you feed him out of a snuffle mat instead of a bowl of a treat, uh, treat dispensing toys like I talked about. But if you're in a hurry, you feed him out of the bowl, put the food in the bowl, put it down, and he's not allowed to eat it. So as you go to put it down, if he starts coming towards it, pull it back up. Make him sit. Make him sit about five feet away. And then once he's seated, start going down. And as soon as he gets up, pull it back up. So what you're saying is when you get up, the food goes away. And then eventually you'll have to do a whole bunch of this back and forth. And you eventually get farther and farther, farther. And you finally put it down and then say, my book. And then when he takes his first bite of food, use that passive training. Come up with a command word that means to eat food in a bowl. Call it like sushi or pasta or steak or whatever you want to say. So every time for four months that he takes his first bite of food, we say the word, uh, you know, tacos. 
And after all, tacos means I get to eat. Don't say tacos if you guys eat tacos a lot. Make it a relatively unique word. Uh, so basically, uh, he's going to watch somebody eat first. Then he gets to eat. Now, he eats all his food, so we don't have to worry about it. When he gets done, I'd like to leave the bowl down on the ground. Since he does paw and bang his bowl when he wants attention, he's demanding things. I would get an elevated feeder. It will help reduce a little bit of the drool. Because uh, when they, they scoop water backwards into their mouth. And they gravity does most of the work. So if his head is like this, all that's gonna drip down. If it's here, the, the gully in the mouth catches a lot of that water, you'll have a little bit less. That's better for them anyways. So get a nice one, put it somewhere, and he won't be able to grab the bowl because it's elevated and in there. Um, okay, so um, when you guys are eating, he should not be within seven feet of you. You guys should watch the video and use, learn how to use this to teach him to go here or elsewhere. Um, uh, let me see, when you're cooking food, he should not be allowed in the kitchen. Now I want you to teach him an out command. So what I do for this is I grab a whole bunch of treats or a kibble, go to every doorway or area that you want him to vacate in your home. So let's say that this is the kitchen and this is the doorway of the kitchen and the hallway is right here. I would go to the, uh, show him that I have the treat, throw the treat outside of the kitchen into the hallway. He runs in the hallway and gets it. I say the word out. Comes back again, I do another one. Then I go to the next doorway. Now we have an area rug right here around the, uh, the table that, that the camera's on. So I'm guessing we eat snacks occasionally here. He should not be allowed on this carpet when anybody has snacks on the couch or the chairs here. He can be anywhere else he wants. Well, except for he can't be like off the side. We were trying to keep you like five to seven feet. So what I would do is I'd throw a piece of kibble here. He runs off the carpet, gets it here. I say out, throw it here, here, here. So I'm throwing it away from. So I do that for around the dinner table, same thing. With the carpet around the dinner table, you're not allowed to be on the carpet, probably even a foot beyond that. The carpet's just a nice line of delineation. Um, and so what we're trying to do is build in scenarios where he wants to do something, but he restrains himself. We want him to develop some self-control, some impulse control. Just because I see doesn't mean I get. So, that, so first of all, we teach him to vacate all the areas by using positive reinforcement. And so what I would do is go, and I also go to every room in the house, go to your bedroom, and then throw the treat in the hallway, and it goes out. Then usually what I do is any room that I might want him to go into, then I repeat the process, but this time I stand in the hallway and throw the treat in your bedroom and say your name or you know uh, a nickname or something that means to go into that room. Dining, living, kitchen. So this way you can direct him to leave any room you want as well as to go to any room that you want. All you have to do is, uh, is you do that like once a day. I would have everybody do it once a day, maybe just one out for every room. And eventually you say out and he just runs out the room and then you would go give him a treat afterwards to pay him for compliance. Um, now, right now, well, one of the things a lot of people do is when they, they, they come home and their dog's excited, they pet the dog and they say, or they say, calm down, man, calm down. Well, the only time I hear calm down is when I'm going crazy. So clearly calm down means spaz out and jump up on the humans. Well, we'll put it in the wrong context. So one of the things we go in our puppy class, if you can get to the point where you pet him like this, when he's nicer and he's lying on the floor right now, just completely relaxed. What happens when he's a fussy baby, his mother will lick him from between his eyes up on his head, along his spine, to the base of his tail. And so that's very soothing for them. So our puppy class, what we tell people to do is pet from the nape of the neck to the base of the tail in slow strokes to kind of emulate that and come up with a command word that means to relax. I say settle. So my clients say zen, chill, Buddha, relaxing, vacation, whatever you want to say. So now you're putting in context when he is completely relaxed, now we pet him when we get to that point and say settle. So now when he's going crazy, we say settle, he knows what we mean. Doesn't mean he's gonna necessarily do it, but he at least understands because we put it in context. So um, there are other rules that you can look at too, like uh, the door. I was showing uh, uh, one of the guardians how to go out the door. Right now when you go to the door, the door opens uh, inside. It right, opens from the left to the right. And so the dog goes right here. So when I go to open the door, the door's coming towards me, the door's blocking me and he has the access route to go out. So I wouldn't open the door with him there, make him on the other side. And you can teach him, call it manners. Go to the door when there's nobody at the door. Have a treat. When he, and you might want to do some clicker training. This uses the beep as a clicker. Clicker is training is usually have, use a click. Um, so basically when he sits down, you click and give him a treat and call it manners or whatever the word that means to go this part of the door. Make sure he's sitting in a position where you can open the door and you can open the door without him having to move. So once he's sitting there and there's nobody at the door, there's no excitement, then I reach for the door. And I'm not even planning on touching the door now. I'm going to reach for the door. And as soon as I do that, he gets up, I pull my hand back, and I tell him to sit. If he sits within three seconds, then I reach again. If he gets up, I pull back and say, sit again. I did that for about five or six times, and then I just started retracting and stopping. And I waited for him to give me the sit automatically because he knows that's what I was waiting for. 
You want to, and at first you'll want, if this is the door knob, first you reach this far before he gets excited, then this far, this far, this far. And each time you reach and he doesn't, let your hand go all the way back to a neutral position, hanging down. Wait for him to sit and then start the whole process. Don't like, because you're halfway. The whole, if you didn't sit, it stops the whole, you get up, it stops the whole process. What we want to do is learn to sit when the door is open. And just because the door opens doesn't mean I have permission to go out. I need to hear the out command. So for that one, what you might want to do is for the outside, in the backyard, maybe you throw the tree dot, you say a word that means maybe whatever direction that is. Well, I wouldn't do that. I would do something specific like yard and call that one, you know, uh, Canada, I, whatever word you want. So you can come up with a word that means to go in the house. Every time he goes in the house, throw the tree in and say casa or house or mansion. So then when he's outside, you say casa. Oh, run inside and get a tree. Cool. I'm down with that. So we put it in context when, we, when he doesn't mind doing it. Later on, there's a dog or somebody coming by and you say, Casa, but I want to play with that guy. If I haven't been spiked or motivated first, I'm going to go for this. But if I've been motivated enough, yeah, I want to play with that guy, but I really like those treats. I'll go inside and get the treat. So you create a command word by putting it in context. So you can do the same thing when you're leaving. Call it journey, jaunt, adventure. That means that we're going to leave the door. So every time you, so you're sitting there, you guys put all your stuff on, you walk the door, you walk through first, and then say adventure, and he follows behind you. Whoever's in front is the leader in the dog world. So um, that exercise, you'll have to, and, and he will probably do it differently with mom versus the, uh, the oldest and the youngest and so on and so forth. They're sizing you all up. So he knows I can get away with this with you, but with your sister, I can get away with even more or less. So uh, it's, that's why it's super important. Every in the house is consistent. So um, again, you put him in the place, you reach, and eventually you can reach when I can finally touch the handle, I jiggled it and that caused him to get up and then I stopped the process again. So what we're doing, and I want you to think of this, not just for the door, but for anything. When I try to teach a hot dog how to behave, what I do is I create the easiest possible scenario of that activity. Then I practice the first step over and over and over until the dog behaves the way I want for the first step without going to the second step. Only when he does it five times in a row the first step do I go to the second step. So the first step is, is tell him to sit and stay seated while I reach for the door. And as soon as I, you get up, I stop the process. Second stage is you sit while I jiggle the door handle. Actually, in your case, j flip the deadbolt. So reach and flip the deadbolt. That sound is associated with the door opening. He's gonna get up and get excited. Pull your arm back and stop. And if, by the way, if he gets excited for this or anything else, when he gets too excited, don't try to fight it. Just wait. Maybe indicate, well, maybe how long has it been since you did that exercise? Maybe we should take him out and do the stairs. So uh, pr pr working with him when he's amicable, don't do it when you're frustrated. Also, when you're training, always make sure the last repetition was a good one. If he starts not performing well and you get frustrated and he doesn't perform well and you got mad, next time he's like, I don't want to do that. Last time we did that, what I remember is you got mad. What I remember what happened at the end. So we want to make sure it's a positive. And training really should be like 90 seconds maximum. If you push too long, they get bored and frustrated and then you're going to make not as good a progress. So the first stage is just sit and I reach for the handle back and forth. Second stage, sit while I jiggle the deadbolt back and forth until I can do it as noisily as I possibly can and he stays seated. Then I pull him back and I, then I jiggle the handle. And I keep doing that until he stays seated. Then I jiggle, uh, open it and open it half an inch and close it immediately, put my hand back. And keep on, and then next time, one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch. And any time that he gets up, we stop the whole process. Because we think of just going out the door as one process, there's a whole lot of little steps. We're gonna teach him, this is the behavior I'm asking from you for each individual step. Most people when a dog misbehaves, we have not taught them how to behave. And we get mad that they don't do what we have not taught them and we don't even occur to us that we should do that. So not only for the door, but for anything else, so like putting down the food. So I start putting it down, you get up, I pull it back. I keep doing it, eventually I get closer and closer and closer. And this is a other great ways for him to develop some self-control and respect for you as an authority figure. So um, uh, those are examples of rules. Try to prevent him from running up and down the stairs ahead of you. That's not as big of a deal. Uh, if, you, if you know, let's say that you wanna go upstairs, he always runs upstairs after you. So let's say you're going to bed in 15 minutes. Well, if you go upstairs and he runs ahead of you, the idea is to come back down and sit down on the couch. Well, if you're ready to go to bed, now you're waiting for him, it pisses you off. So instead, 15 minutes before you go to bed, get your, go to the kitchen to get a glass of water and then start walking up the stairs. You're not even planning. You know that he's gonna run up the stairs. So he runs up past you. As soon as he passes you, you turn around and come back and sit back downstairs. You were watch TV anyways. He's like, all right, now where are we going? Where, where'd she go? And he comes back down and says, are, are we not going to bed? Yeah, when I want to, but as soon as you move ahead of me, I lose interest. So we practice this over and over again until he stays behind you as you're going up and down the stairs or out the door or whatever it is. So those are rules. 
We also went over petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is just what it says. Petting your dog with a reason or a purpose to pet him. I consider petting the dog our way of paying the dog. So if right now he's like, he runs up and people are like, can I pay you? He's like, yes, you may pleasure me. And then, you know, cause we don't want to get bit. But that kind of creates a little bit of a dynamic that's not really healthy for him. So what we do instead, go to the, uh, we wanna, he comes up to us, if he paws at you, he's telling you what to do. If you validate and pet him, you're saying, yep, you're the boss of me. Leaders tell, followers ask. So next time he comes up and paws at you, give him a counter order. Tell him to sit or to lie down. Don't practice shape. So if he sits within three seconds, uh, I'd like you to put him under his chin or give him a treat. Now I'm going to show you the way that I would like you to give him a treat. You want to come over here, buddy? It's like if there's a treat involved, I am down. So I have one treat in my hand. I'm curling my hand up a little bit so you can see he's looking at my hand. But if you let him show him I got a treat, well, then when you don't have a treat, it won't work. So this works better if you're at the, at, for the side, buddy. Can we come this way? So I'm going to use this to lure him. Then I go an arc over his head. When he sits, I lower it, let him lick it off my hand, and I tickle under his chin. So we want to get him used to that motion. So I get a treat. I'm not going to bite because I like the treat. Let's get over here. It's better if it's sideways. And then sit. You keep on going over there. Sit. Sit. Now see how he pulled his head away. So that would be when I would stop petting him. So I want to give him at least a little bit of that. If he turns his head to the side, at first he probably will. After a while, he'll just kind of be like, whatever, you're weird, you like doing that. That's fine. Yeah. We're getting him used to us petting him, but it's associated with a trick with a treat. And then if I don't have anything in my hand, like, well, come over here, buddy. So the idea is we mimic this, and then he he gets a treat always at first. And then after a while, you can go like that and put him in a sit, or if he's not paying attention, you can hold up your hand like this, but sell it. I love it. Like, hold up your hand like a treat. And a lot of people go like, well, you just showed him you got nothing in your hand. So pretend like you have a marble there. You see what good control I have with him, even though my hand is empty. Don't fake him out too many times, though, because he won't want to do that. Um, so basically, so he comes up and nudges you. You say, sit. He sits. Give him a treat, and then you pet him on his chin if you feel, if, as long as he's not turning away. And you pet as much or as little as you want is what I normally say for him. If he turns his head to the side, then we'll be respectful of him and say, okay, he's done. Okay, we'll stop. But what we're saying is when you tell the human what to do now, nothing happens. But if the human tells you what to do and you do it, you get hooked up. You get a reward. After a while, the dog will start sitting in front of you to prepay for the attention. When he does that, we're going to pull into our treat pouch. Give him that treat and use that same flat hand motion so we can tickle him under his chin and hopefully we get him past this and he has enough. Once we get him about three months where he hasn't bit anyone when we're petting him, we should be getting closer to like it's less likely for him to do so. And also we're changing the leader follow dynamic. I can't tell them anymore. I have to ask. If I ask them, if I ask somebody for somebody, something, I'm not going to slap them when they do it. And that's kind of what little bit of what he's doing. So uh, basically what we're doing for him is we're just going to make him earn these rewards. If he's already sitting, ask him to come and sit over here or ask him to lay down. And so he has to sit or lay down because those are more subordinate body postures. Um, and also we like to pet a dog under the chin. A lot of us, we reach over the head and a lot, see how he got up? I don't like that. Most dogs don't like it. So when all things being equal, we'll try to pet him under his chin because we want to facilitate that nose up because proud dogs have a nose in the air. We want to be a proud dog. Um, okay, so let's say I tell him to sit. He doesn't sit. Working, playing hard to get works great for dating. It works great for dogs too. So if I tell him to sit, sit. Um, but if he didn't sit, I'm going to show him I got other things to do. Pull out your phone, watch a little TV, and don't wait like a minute, two minutes, three minutes, or whatever I, like I talked before. Just wait a little bit of your time. Show him, you know what? The world does not revolve around you. I made you number one on my list, but if you can't be bothered to sit, I got 23 other things to do and it, no skin off my back. After a while, he's going to miss that petting and, or the attention and he's going to start offering the sits or whatever it is for them. Um, and when he does that, like I said, make sure you pet him at least a little bit to, or give him a treat at least a little bit. But if you get him used to this treat and then the tickle, you should be able to eventually just go to the tickle without having to worry about that. Uh, remind me to go over body uh, uh, posture in a, in a second, I forget. Um, so uh, now what if, we, what if I want to pet him? He's not demanding attention, but I see he looks so cute, I want to pet him. Well, sit. Good boy. Um, and try not to say good boy. Um, so basically, um, if I want to pet him, I'm still going to tell him to sit or down. Then I can give him the treat and pet him and do all that fun stuff. So I'm making him earn that affection. 
if you get in, uh, if you think that somebody's forgotten, I like to say paycheck. So I come in the room and I see the Kurt's petting the dog and he's standing up and I say paycheck. Now, if I, you know, Kurt and I are buddies, so he might be like, no, man, you missed it. Well, don't argue like that because the dog thinks, interprets that differently than we want them to. Instead, when I say uh, paycheck, that means I suspect you may have forgotten to pet with a purpose. It's, very, it's not a criticism. It's like but, busted or gotcha. So if somebody says it to me, I say, oh, I stop petting. I say crash, which is the word I use for down. When he lays down, I pet him and say crash. And I turn to my partner and say, actually, I asked him to, uh, to do whatever before he came in. When you stood up, when you, you stood up when you heard, opened the door. And I continue to pet him, but thank you, because I do forget to pet without a purpose. Um, so even if you did it right, stop, tell him to do the right thing, then go back to what you were doing. Uh, and then pet him for it. Uh, so, uh, and if he doesn't, like I said, we don't pet him. Um, if you get in a habit of petting with a purpose, every time you pet or give your dog a treat in this way, it becomes a micro dog training session that accomplishes three important things. First of all, it increases the dog's respect for you as an authority figure because I'm asking you and prepaying for it versus demanding or telling. Number two, I boost my self esteem because I earned this pet. I didn't just get this for looking good. Number three, it helps him practice sitting which will, is a more supportive position, which will help with other situations as well. Truly becomes a gift. And it'll take you guys about three months to get in the habit of doing that. Passive training is waiting for him to offer you the behavior organically without any influence. He sees I have a treat, he comes over and sits down. Well, he wants the treat. But I'm just watching TV, I don't have any treats, I haven't had my treat pouch, but no, you know, and he comes up and sits down and I reach over and pet or say the word or give him a treat for sitting. I'm rewarding him for a specific act. And dogs do what gets our attention from us. Most of us just train our dogs to misbehave. He comes to us, we ignore. He sits in front of us, we ignore. He lays down, we ignore. But boy, as soon as he starts barking, we correct. As soon as he starts chewing the rock, then we correct. Biting someone, hopefully we correct. But uh, so if for dogs, good attention, bad attention, same thing. So if getting, if you're, if I do this, you yell at me, sweet, you're not yelling at anybody else, I'm getting all that validation. So what we wanna do is just be cognizant of that. So every time he offers things accidentally without us intending, we reward him. And, uh, and, and when he does it in certain contexts, so when he takes uh, his first bite of food, we say sushi for four months. And we say sushi and he goes, that means I get to eat. When he drinks water, say agua. Um, if he has issues with other dogs, one of the things you, I pet my dogs for is a uh, stretch because they kind of put their butt in the air and they have chest on the ground, they stand up, Woo! well, the, this is with the chest down, the butt in the air is called a play bow. So I want my dogs to help me with other dogs. So if a dog's barking and beefing at us, I tell my dog to stretch, then I was like, Woo! he's like, hey, you ass, oh, oh, you're friendly. Oh, I'm sorry. So we can help emulate by offering dogs certain particular behaviors. What happens, he's, we've already trained him, trained him to do this, the guardian's out, he paws at them and they pet him. So this gets me a pet. Well, after a while, this will get me the pet. Laying down will give me the pet. Sitting will give me a pooping in the right place. And so on. So we're going to make it easy for him to know what he can do to make us happy. And after a while, he'll start emulating those behaviors over and over. Um, I also showed the guardians how to use a touch stick. That Sophia Yen is going to take care of that in the videos. But another exercise that I did was a hand targeting exercise. And this is a great thing to do because it teaches him to target our hands, even though that doesn't sound necessarily good when we have a dog that barks. So when I do this, I, I want a big chopping movement. Dogs' or eyes are very attracted to movement. And the progression for this is first turn, then lean, then step, then multiple steps. So when I karate chop, I'm gonna karate chop on either side of his head. And once I karate chop, my arm is frozen. So I'm gonna see if we can get turn, lean, step, steps. Here, it's easier if you're laying down like you were. Down? Better for the camera at least. There we go. You can see him in the shot, right? Mm -hmm. Touch. And that's why I like to hold my hand at an angle so I can kind of keep the treat there. So at first we had a lean or a turn, then we had a lean. Let's see if we can get a step. Touch. Steps. Remember, always say the command word after the treat goes in his mouth. So what we want to do is get him move further and further away. So if he's like beefing us, somebody say target, or excuse me, touch. I say target for a different word, but for him, we're using that for the hand, uh, the wand. So after a while, you can go like, and it looks kind of like I have the force. I can lead him over whichever direction I want. We're just teaching him to go and target a hand. Uh, eventually, you can have him target the hand for longer periods of time. Uh, some people will actually use this to, uh, is that still recording? Good. I put it in airplane mode. 
Uh, if I don't put it in airplane mode, it interrupts the recording, so I've learned to put it in record. As long as there's a timer still going on the top, we're still good. Okay, so basically, um, uh, some people will do this like with a thing of baby, uh, baby food, freeze it, and then walk, and the dog's like licking out of your baby food and walking in a heel. Or some people will keep the dog against their thumb, uh, their hand. If you want to take a picture of him and he's positioned the wrong way, if I push him, he might bite or push back. So I can go like this. Sit. And now I've got him facing this direction, the direction I want, instead of physically manipulating or manhandling him. I also showed the Guardians a leave it exercise. Um, now I have videos for this, so if you forget how to do this, let me know. And I'm just going to show you the quick recap. So first of all, um, I, I have a whole bunch of treats in this hand, in this hand, and one in this, and these are stinky treats. So I'm just letting him, and when he disengages on his own, then I give him the treat. I'm not saying leave it at this point. So I want to just say, teach him that trying to challenge and take the treat doesn't work. As soon as you give up, guess what happens? You get a treat. Sit, sit. So the next stage is I want to drop it on the floor. Now the way that I do this is I usually have uh, just one treat in my in each hand. And so sit, so I go like this, and if he goes to, whichever hand he goes to, I bend that one away, and then I drop the other one. And I collapse over it, wait for him to look at me, and now I say leave it when it goes into his mouth. So the, that, the first stage is you only do this, you probably won't have to do this at all. You're gonna be doing the drop. So, and then again, now I reach for a second treat, because he never ever gets the one on the ground. If I can get one out here, there we go. Well, over here so we don't have better camera presence. See, being in the running for TV shows is helping for that. Sit. Leave it. And then I pick it up. I was waiting for him to look me in the eyes. That's, a more, per that's more advanced. At first, all he has to do is I drop it, and as soon as he, uh, and if he goes for it, I collapse down. I'm mirroring him. So if I drop it here, I hold it here. If he stays there, if I pull it back, it takes one step, I go a little bit. I just go as little as I need to. So I can either cover it, I can cage it, or I can hover over it. And eventually you want to get to the point where you're doing pretty much hovering, and then you're elongating the duration. So I'm ready to move my hand there if he goes for it. But I don't want to keep it over because eventually we're not going to want to do that. So I'm waiting for him to look up at me, leave it, and then I pick up the item. So then later on, when he starts going towards a sock or something, you say, leave it. He, oh, who's going to be, who's, who's, is somebody painting? Who's going to be a treat? So eventually what I was telling the guardians, what I do is I went to like Lowe's or Home Depot and I have people with like real chicken from Chipotle, warm chicken, going down every five feet and dropping a portion. And we're at the end of it on a leash. And I start walking towards it. Susan, oh, chicken, chicken, oh, chicken. I'm like, leave it. He looks up at me. As we walk over it, the tree is coming down. By the time he gets the tree, he's like, all right, chicken. Oh, chicken's back there. Okay, well, there's more chicken there. So we're teaching him, giving something up that you see, guarantee gets you a better, better reward. And then we've created the concept. So if he sniffs in a trash can, you say, leave it. You should back away from it. Um, there's a whole, and this is also another thing that just, instead of him getting into the wrong thing, that's trying to take it from him, that makes it forbidden fruit. So we're just teaching him, leaving stuff alone and listening to him is rewardable. Now, first, I, we just want him just to disengage. Then we want him to look at us. If he's just looking at the tree, he's almost objectifying it. We don't understand that if I don't know what to do, look at the human. Now, I'm going to show you a, a focus exercise as well, and I showed the guardians how to do this. I'm just going to run through it here with you real quick. Um, but uh, this is something that can be a stress reducer the way that I teach it. So I'm going to lead him over here. Come here, buddy. So I have one treat in this hand and a whole bunch of treats in this hand. I'm going to make my hands look uniform. I'm going to put a sit. I'm going to put them on my knees. And he's going to go and lick and try to take it. I'm waiting for him to disengage and look up at my face. I'm not saying anything to him. I'm waiting for him to look. And watch him like a hawk when you do this. If he, it can be an eye flutter, which he gives you a lot. Focus. But if you miss it, it might take a long time. Then I immediately reload so he knows we're still playing. Put it back on my knees. Focus. So I always raise to my nose, and then go straight from my nose to his, his nose. Or to his mouth. I missed that one. One second, one second. Focus. Don't hold it to your nose. So I'll do it again without... This is how it should be. Focus. A lot of people go like this and start going really slow. Eventually, you want to get really slow in the second movement. Eventually, it'll be like this. See how they came to it? That's why we want to be progressive. So at first, with all 12 treats, one second up, one second to his mouth, and say the word focus. And do this in a whole bunch of, not only this, but all training, do it in different parts of your house. If you only do something here, he'll do it here and won't be able to do it elsewhere. 
Dogs don't generalize well. So once you get to the point where he's pretty much staring at you the whole time, then we go one second. And his eyebrows being shifted will help out a little bit too. Maybe make a little, one second, one, two seconds, focus. But he should, should not get up. He should just sit there and wait for it. And eventually you get to three seconds, four seconds, and eventually you're 15 seconds. But anytime, if you go like from five to 10, and you go at five and at six, he looks away, then back up and go one second at a time. So what you want to do is within a week, I've got to move, buddy. My legs will not work if I sit that way for too long. So if I, uh, within a week, I want him to be able to have that 15 second stare at me while he's waiting to get the treat. So you do it all over the house, uh, bedrooms, everywhere else, with, but they'll get bored with this. So within seven days, make sure you've achieved it. The next stage is to go out on your deck here and practice outside. Outside, you have distractions, sight, sound, smells. Sit. Um, and so the idea is now it's harder, so we go back to one second, one second, but he knows how to do the game, so we can move faster. So one second, one second for three treats, one second, two seconds for three treats, one second, three seconds for three treats, and until we get done. And then, so you wanna to get to outside where you can get the 15 second outside within about two days. And people, in a week, it doesn't take, if you do it a lot, you can get there in three or four days. Um, then outside, one or two days. Now, the next stage is do it on a walk. Now we're doing a walk, we've been doing this for over a week, and so we should have the verbal cue. So when he's walking next to you, and there's nobody around, there's no reason for him to be reactive or distracted, you say focus, and he looks up at you, and you go, as you're walking, you raise your, and go boom, and get what it is about. One second up, one second, but do this while you're walking. Everybody stops, don't stop. When your dog's reacting, the best thing to do is to increase distance. If your dog's ever having a problem, or you think it might be reactive, don't have them stationary. When they're moving, they're easier to get away from, uh, for them not to focus on things. So now we're going to go and do the same thing. So first it's one second, one second for, you know, 10 treats or so. And if he's pretty much just staring at you, eventually you go focus. He looks up at you and for 15 seconds, that treat is coming down and he's like running into stuff because he's not paying attention where he's going. The whole point of this is to redirect his attention away from things before he gets into them. So the more that we do this, the easier it gets. Um, and um, yes, crash, that's passive training. Um, uh, so remember, say celebrate if somebody is forgetting to passively train their dog. I say paycheck if I think they're petting without a purpose. Vocabulary means you're using the wrong version of the word. Repeat or rerun means you're using, uh, say repeating the word too many times. And maybe baby talk, somebody in the house is, oh my little baby, blah, blah, blah. And you can do that, that's fine if you're just hanging out. But if you're training him, we want us to be concise and just use the command word. Now, one of the games I like to have people play is to learn how to read their dog's body language. Now, he has some chow and some Eastern Asian dog stuff, and he's, his fur makes it a little bit challenging, especially with his eyes. So, I mean, he has a really cute haircut the way she does it, but make, her, make it a little bit shorter so we need to focus a lot of stuff. You want to be able to see his eyes. Um, so, uh, next haircut, have her go short, and they can go back to this because it's a cute cut. Uh, but basically, for body language, um, now, we talked about a little bit about breathing. He's breathing heavily. So if he's kind of relaxed and he hasn't been doing anything athletic and suddenly he starts and you can see him moving, his chest moving, often that's stress. Most of us get confused an excited dog for a happy dog. Because when they're excited, they're, they need to cool down. And the way they cool down is letting liquid evaporate their tongue. Well, if I'm, that's why I do it. Well, we interpret that as a smile. So what do we do? When the dog's overstimulated, we get them more excited because we think that means happy. But if I'm gonna have surgery, the last thing I want my surgeon to be is excited. I want her to be calm, cool, and collected and focused. Dogs, the more excited we make them, the more likely they are to make mistakes. So when you come home and if he's all excited, wait. Just pretend, or don't wait, just ignore him. Pretend he's not even there. And as soon as he gets, calms down, reach for him. And as soon as he gets excited, pull back and continue doing what you're thinking. Same thing I talked about at the door. So what we're saying is when you're very calm, you're very attractive to me, kind of like when I'm drunk, I'm very attractive to everyone. I'm not, not so much. But so when he's, when he's calm, he's very attractive. Everyone wants to pat him, give you treats or engage with you. When you're excited, you're invisible to us. We're not saying no. We're not saying calm down. We're not getting mad. You just get nothing from us. We're boring to him because we're not engaging. And after a while, he'll start. So he's, he's calmed down. He's not breathing. He's relaxed. We want to see his over breathing stop, uh, you know, uh, being so worked up. And, I, and also, when he does see, do see that, take note. What's going on? Does, are there four girls in the basement filming videos, singing? Well, he can hear all that stuff. And that causes him to have me a little bit stressed. And on nerve, he thinks he's in charge of these humans, but these humans don't listen to him. And just like parents who have a child who doesn't listen to him, that stresses out the parent because they're worried about the safety of their child. I'm pretty sure that there's a component of that that's going on here. So basically what we want to do is learn to read his body language. So when you guys are at home and it's just the crew, there's nobody else, there's no, he's not breathing heavy, he's relaxed. 
Look at him and take note of his overall body mechanics. How is he carrying his head? Is his nose up? Is it parallel to the ground? Is it tilted down a little bit? There's no right or wrong. We just want to know what his normal is. Where are his ears? Are they forward like this or are they flip back? Are they out to the side? Are they rounded? Is the, is the front of the flap of the ear facing forward or is it facing the side or is it almost facing backwards? The, and so uh, look at his, uh, where is his chin? Are his lips way back here or are they in the front? When they start being pulled way back, that can be a sign of stress. If you can see his eyes, what are his eyes doing? Are his pupils dilated? Where is his tail? He has a curly tail like this. Is it curled like this or is it spooled out and relaxed or is it sticking out the side of his spine? A look at his overall body. Is he kind of hunched over or is he relaxed or what's he doing? What we want to do is identify his neutral body mechanic, what is normal. Then when you start seeing deviations from that, you start seeing, ooh, his ears are in a weird position. His tail's doing this. His tail's... So then when you see him, when you know he's relaxed and you know what that is, then you know he's excited and happy because one of the girls came home, comes home. Now he's excited, but he's also happy. What is his tail doing then? Where are his ears then? All the rest of that stuff. So learning how to read your dog's body mechanics gives you the ability to, because I mean, it seems to come out of nowhere, but usually there are warning signs. There will usually be a couple seconds. So if you see, he's like cool, I would say he starts breathing heavy, his ears go back, he lowers his head, his tail goes up. You're like, oh, those are deviations from the norm. Oh, there's somebody, you know, honey, please don't pet him. So you can get him out of trouble before it starts. If you, if, uh, when you're watching this, remember to send me a text and I'll send you a picture of the thing that we have for the door. But it's a cool door art, I just a picture of it, you can find somebody to recreate it. But it basically has instructions, when you come in, you know, ignore our dog till it's calm. When it's completely calm, take this little bag of treats that we give you and start reaching to give him a treat. As soon as he gets up, pull it away. And so after a while, he starts learning when people come over, they're here to hook me up. Now, something else you can do is if people come over and they have a dog, especially they have a little dog, tell them to grab their dog, rub it up against their legs. We want him to start sniffing people when they come in. He doesn't use his nose. And part of it might be because he's got a kind of a little bit of a broken nose, not from a being boxer. But um, so we want him to meet, oh, that's, that's Jane. I remember how Jane smells. Now he can smell from here. He doesn't have to have me stick his hand, my hand in his face, but we want him to start meeting with his nose. That's how they should meet. So anyways, uh, if you recognize his body mechanics, then you start seeing those deviations from it, then you can do the focus exercise. But if he's reactive, the only thing to do is take him away from whatever it is until he can sit and take a treat. Those are my two tests. If he won't sit or won't take the treat, he probably still has cortisol or is still so close to whatever it is, he's reactive. So the idea is to, oh, my humans are gonna get me out of the situation. When he acts aggressive or acts tough, what he's saying is I don't feel comfortable with this distance. I want more distance between us. And I find if I act tough, that makes you go away. Well, the other option is I can turn him go away, but dogs don't think about it that way. So we have to help them. So that's where if he's like staring at somebody, say target or touch, and he So he doesn't have it. So if you chop and he doesn't do that, pull back, chop closer. Touch. But it, it, you can use the touch as an alternative form of, of recall. But again, we're promoting him coming to our hands and something good happening. So that way a hand approaching him is gonna have a better uh, uh, better rationale. I think, again, I don't think he's an aggressive dog. I think he was probably in pain, and there's some confusion. I think there's probably several things that are going on. When he licks you, if you like it, say kisses. Uh, my dog, I say kisses, they lick me anywhere. If I say smooch or love, it means to lick me right here. And so, again, I qualified it. Um, so you can you t train him to do anything with that passive training. It's super duper easy. Also, uh, dogs that are very confident are less likely to be reactive. Confident people brush things off. Insecure people melt down. So teaching him new tricks and commands, the treat and train is going to show you a couple things. Um, Dr. Sophia Yen, uh, you watch some of her videos. One of the videos she shows how to teach him to do a somersault. Well, teach him bang your dead. The more tricks, more skills that we have as humans, the more confident we are. When you pass a test at school, you feel kind of good. Yeah, I mastered it. I don't have to deal with that anymore. That was horrible. I hated that subject, but you passed it. Um, so for us, and we learn a skill that might help you, uh, you know, do a, shoot a video better or do something else. That those skills help us in our life. So dogs, um, I like the dynamic that is achieved when there is a leader follower, and so a mentor, a protege, or you know, uh, sort of thing. So the idea is what, what I like you guys to do is once a week go to YouTube and have everybody in the house once a week pick a trick that we're going to teach, and that person is going to teach the dog the trick. Make sure it's all positive. If anything that's forceful, don't do it with him, especially with him. I don't want to recommend for anybody, especially not with him. 
So once he's doing rollover, which I think is one of the things the Guardian's going to teach him, I'll show you how to do that. Then you want to go outside, roll over. You want me to pet you, roll over. You want to eat food, roll over. So after a while, you like look at him, he's like rolling over. And then the next week, you teach somebody else takes over, and they teach him a trick. And then down. So if you don't have a treat, you just say the word when he does something you like. So that next person takes over, they teach him. If you're teaching a rollover, the next one should be bang your dead because they kind of use the same components. Um, and then the next week, and then all, all week long, we practice, uh, you know, bang your dead. The next week, we teach him something else. And, you know, maybe a hurricane, you know, do a circle or whatever it is. The idea is now everybody in the house is an educator and a teacher, and they're involved in teaching me a new skill that it also helps me have a boost of self esteem. So I have more respect for them as an authority figure. We're also gonna stop petting with a purpose, without a purpose. So all these things are gonna help flip and create what I call a healthy leader follower dynamic. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that I covered that you want me to go over or anything you want me to talk about? I think that covered it. That's I've done awesome. this. A, I've done this a couple times. Yeah. All right, uh, let's get over here, buddy. Let's sign off together. Where'd the name come from, by the way? Is that the name he had? I, 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 no, it Six. isn't. Sit. Well, can we turn around so everybody can up. see you? The girls came up with that, I think. There you go. Good. Oh. Sit. Sit. Well, this is Milo, and this is Milo's Roadmap to Success. Remember, as I drop treats, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.